Is Rishi Sunak's premiership in peril? Labour's plan to tax private school fees? And is Vladimir Putin the new Stalin? This is Politics Live. Joining me, Conservative MP Bob Seeley, Shadow Business Minister Sarah Jones, Bloomberg Associate Editor Alva Ray, and The Daily Mail's Inaya Falarin Imam. Today, Rishi Sunak launches a fight back. We are absolutely moving in the right direction. So let's stick to the plan and build a better, brighter future together. But some Tory MPs want Penny Mordaunt to carry the sword for the party into the general election. I'm sure if Penny was here, she would be uh, distancing herself from those comments. This is about the way that black women are disrespected. Should Diane Abbott, who was suspended from the party almost a year ago, be a Labour MP again? I will end the tax loophole, which exempts private schools from paying VAT and business rates. We will put that money into helping the 93% of our children who are in our state schools. But how much will that policy raise? And this is a headline that could have been written yesterday. Vladimir Putin wins by a landslide in the Russian presidential elections. Whoever might want to suppress us, our will and our conscience, they have never been able to do it and never will. Let's start with the result of the presidential election in Russia, a foregone conclusion. Pretty well, the Daily Telegraph has this headline. Putin is a modern-day Stalin, says Shaps after Russian leader wins sham election. It's from an article by the Defence Secretary, Grant Shaps, who accuses Vladimir Putin of stealing Sunday's so-called election where political opponents are either imprisoned or murdered. My opening question, starting with you, Bob, is, is Putin a modern-day Stalin? Well, he's clearly a modern-day dictator, and I think he's taken, sad to say, he's taken Russia back into a direction that a lot of Russians are familiar with, so rigged and staged elections. And if you're an older Russian, you'll certainly remember that from the days of the Soviet Union. Rather than just saying he's like this or like that, I, I, I think it's much more important that we talk about what this outcome me means for the war in Ukraine, but also Putin's conflict against us, because we shouldn't be under any illusion. Mm. Putin believes he's fighting NATO, whether that's in information warfare, whether that's in the grain warfare across the Black Sea, oh. whether it's in the physical warfare in eastern and northern Ukraine. He thinks he's at war against us. And all this nuclear rhetoric, we have to understand that there is a scare factor, but there's also a real factor as well. Sarah, do you think uh, Vladimir Putin is a modern-day Stalin? Well, clearly this was a sham democratic exercise um, and it was designed to suppress dissent. It was designed to suppress free speech and the people of um, Russia will know that. No amount of propaganda can cover up what he's doing in Ukraine and we all need to stand firm and be really clear that he cannot be allowed to win that war and we must do all we can and there are consequences for our country in terms of that but we must be really steadfast because when we saw I mean the elections that were carried out in occupied areas of Ukraine you know we need to stand with the people of Ukraine now. I mean he is now set to stay in power until at least 2030. Um, he won uh, by 87.8 percent of the vote the highest apparently in post-Soviet history. So is that a fair comparison to make with Stalin? Well, in terms of the length of time in office, definitely Stalin was in power for 29 years. We're looking at... Uh, I'm doing, mixing them up already. Um, we're looking at Putin being in power for 30 years. Mm. And, and in terms of the style of leadership, there are, there are clear parallels, even though it's quite a, a forceful parallel being drawn yeah. by, by, by Grant Shapps. But I, I, I agree with Bob that really the more pertinent question is, what does this mean for the for the world order in the next six years? What what are Putin's plans next? You know? Yeah, I think it's just yet another example that I think after the Cold War there was this, uh, I think, naivety amongst a lot of the Western uh, political class that with the spread of economic prosperity and the triumph of liberal democracy that there will just be this kind of inevitable spreading of, of societies that share our outlook and share our values. And I think as we have seen over the last few years, that was uh, perhaps dangerously naive. And I think, as has already been said, I mean, what 
now in this new world that we're in, where there are powers that are hostile, antagonistic, mm. such as uh, Russia, but also Iran and, and, and China, um, where is Britain's place in the world going to be? Especially as when you look at America now, we don't know the result of the upcoming election, but mm. we hear from uh, the mm. potential president, Donald Trump, saying that um, he is very sceptical about funding NATO. And so what is that going to mean for the UK? Well, let's talk uh, about funding and uh, UK support ongoing uh, for the war in Ukraine by listening to Lord Robertson, the former Sec uh, General Secretary uh, to NATO, who was talking about the West's continuing support for Ukraine uh, on the Westminster Hour last night to Ben Wright. What is disturbing to me is, you know, we had a budget in the United Kingdom last week with no mention at all of defence or defence expenditure or increasing it. And although Mr Shapps, the new defence secretary, is now talking about 3% on defence, there was no indication in the budget from the Chancellor or from the Prime Minister that they're willing to make the serious investment that would actually turn the tide in this conflict. Any government now has got to recognise just how important this conflict is and to respond appropriately to it. And I think that an incoming government, whatever that incoming government is, is going to have to recognise how perilous the world is for the British population and act appropriately. Well, did you agree with Lord Robertson? Were you disappointed by the budget and the failure to announce specifically more money for defence? Uh, I'd love to see us to go to 2.5 and then to 3%. Um, when? I'm, I'm, as soon as possible. But uh, to answer your question, I'm also, I have a lot of sympathy with Jeremy Hunt. If we don't have a growing economy, then you know, that we're going to be robbing Peter to pay Paul. But so he didn't the, say anything about so it. The, so the answer to this is that we get our economy growing. Do we need to be spending more on defence in general? Yes. I would just say throwing money at a problem now is not the way that you're going to deal with it. I think that actually we need to think about what we need. So let me well, give you a couple of examples. Just to interject, but just to interject, I'm slightly confused. Do we need to spend more money yes. on defence? There was no mention yes. of it by Jeremy Hunt. And colleagues of yours have said we need to get to 2.5% yeah. now. Or are you saying if we don't grow the economy, we can't afford it? I, I would like us to see, I, I would like to see us spending more on defence. I respect and understand why Jeremy is saying Money's still tight. We need to be growing the economy. It is a tricky balance because right. well, we also Sarah, have the public spending. Do you agree, well, the public spending, you agree with uh, that? Is that going well. to be the same uh, view taken by an incoming Labour government if you well, win the election? I mean, firstly, for 14 years we've heard money's still tight. We need to be careful about public spending. I mean, we haven't grown the economy in all that time. Sure. And, of course, that but has to be a priority. But you think you're going to grow the economy What too. I would just say is that um, uh, clearly um, the army has been hollowed out 40,000 less troops, um, the number of um, aircrafts number of ships all down. We need to um, have a strategic defence review as a Labour government because we need to be clear what the capabilities are, what the intelligence are, what the information is, much of which we do not have access to in opposition. So we would want to do a strategic defence review at pace uh, if there was a Labour government. But clearly we need to make sure we're responding to the new threats uh, that we see around us that were so well mm. described that go way beyond Russia. Um, and we do have to uh, have a plan to grow the economy alongside that because that's one of the reasons why well, we don't have the funding well, that we need. Well, let, but let Bob respond. Have you hollowed out defences and our capability? Sorry, let's, uh, uh, it'd be great to keep this still focused on Ukraine, but just by way of fact, since 2010, the economy has grown 23 per cent, and wow. since 2010, the economy has grown faster than any other major All right. European and economy. Our population has grown faster, not because. If you look at it per capita, the, the, it you, hasn't. What you said Our population has grown because of all the what migration you said was wrong, that you've So let's talk had. about Ukraine. No, that's not wrong. But that's the clarification. Our, our that's a clarification. Okay. Our can I get back to? Can we get back you to can, talk about You can. You can. Yes. The, although you really brought up the growth issue, but yes, go the, go back. The, to the really now. important point here is not that we just say, let's throw some more money at defence, but what do we need it for? And we need it for two or three very specific things. We need production lines for armour, for shells, 155 shells, which the Ukrainians are going through thousands a day and sometimes tens of thousands a week. We need that. And we also need to make sure that they win the battle of first-person view drones, which are effectively going to be the infantry weapons of the future. Fine. The danger is mm. when you have people like Macron saying, we're going to put troops mm. in there, mm. but we're not going to supply you, you give Putin the, ex the, the chance to argue that he is now in an existential war against NATO. What, what people like Macron, who are not 
playing their share, not delivering what they want, but are saying, oh, we'll send troops right, instead. Well, put, this putting is Macron, super, super Putting dangerous. Macron to one side, because those comments were pretty well dismissed by other Western leaders, and just Please focusing them. on what politicians like you um, are saying to the public. Mm -hmm. And do you have to level with the public and say, if we're going to move to 2.5%, that is broadly speaking about 10, maybe 12 billion pounds more, where are you going to find the money? What are you going to stop doing? Or are you going to increase taxes? Because 10 billion pounds is not going to be magic out of thin air. Let's put growth to one side for a moment, because with the best will in the world, getting the sort of growth that both parties are talking about has been, well, it's been impossible, pretty well impossible. <coughs> so where would you get the money from? Um, to be honest, I, I haven't, do I have a glib answer to that problem? No. But there are It doesn't always... have to be glib. Well, <laughs> can I say, well, you try, uh, I hope that Jeremy has committed to, was it two and a half billion, to get, use AI, to use efficiencies in the way that um, the NHS does its business. We've seen the passport office actually deliver a world-class public service now because it's using smart technology, etc. So if we can find these savings and actually, you know, get more people in work through the DWP sure. budgets, then that is the way that we can well, find that money. But we need to find it. You're yeah, absolutely right. Well, you need right. to find well, I'm not pretending okay, it's going well, to be Okay, well, it's as much a priority as it is for Bob. And where would you find it? Well, we've seen about 14, 15 billion pounds wasted through poor defence procurement, which is a good starting point. Huge amounts of money are wasted through defence procurement. And secondly, can we be building some of the infrastructure that we need in this country, whether it's our steel, our ships, our aerospace, can we be building more of that in our country, <laughs> which will help us grow the economy and create the wealth that we need in that circular way to have a, a more buoyant economy. Just briefly on the honesty, there is a trade-off here, isn't there? Yeah, and I think an, an important or interesting context for this discussion is that if you speak to a lot of politicians privately, they, you know, they are aware of this context, context that we've all discussed, mm. the, the, the growing threat from, from Putin and the changing global world order. But the reality is that spending on defence is one of the least popular areas yeah, for defence in the UK. Absolutely. When you look at polling on it, yeah. if you ask people what they want more spending on, it's overwhelmingly on the NHS, then there's education, then mm. there's crime. Defence tends to be right at the bottom along with um, overseas aid. It's ticked up a little bit over the past couple of years, but I think for either party to be making the case for defence spending is actually a bit tricky given the public's priorities. We're just going to move on to these uh, front pages, giving our viewers a flavour of the sort of political speculation from the weekend. Um, the Daily Express heads, Tory MPs plot to topple Rishi is just self-indulgence. That's from <coughs> Common Sense Minister Esther McVeigh. Uh, let's have a look at the headline in the Daily Telegraph. Embattled Prime Minister urges Tories, stick with me because the economy is going to or is turning a corner. The Times has similar. This is our bounce back year, Sunak tells critics, the year of a general election, and uh, the Daily Mail. Sunak allies rage at Penny. That's Penny Mordaunt. You'll have seen her there in the headlines. Um, are you a Penny Mordaunt fan, uh, Bob? I'm a great fan of Penny Mordaunt, and I supported her very strongly for the leadership, uh, and I wish she won it. However, Rishi is the leader, and actually, we need to respect that and get behind it. I don't think Penny has anything to do with this. And actually, I want to focus on the stuff that matters. Mm. People watching your programme, whether on the Isle of Wight, whether they're anywhere else in the UK, yes. what they want to know is what's happening. And actually, Rishi has a really good story to tell on the economy. In the last few years, we have been hit for six yeah, by COVID, sure. by, um, by the 93 billion that we had to spend on keeping people, you know, and helping people through the, I... the inflation spike. We, uh, the economy is now back on track. Inflation is, what, down to 2%. Well, and that's certainly, um, that's certainly going to be the line from Rishi Sunak. Well, and, I mean, there are obviously me. people, politicians, are feeding stories to the papers um, well, about this cool issue. Then. Do you want to see Rishi Sunak no. take the Conservative Party yes. into the next yeah, election? Yeah, sorry, I, yeah, didn't, no. I, didn't, I didn't know what your question <laughs> yes, was going to be. Well, for uh, no, yeah, I absolutely, yes. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I, every time I used to get into a helicopter in Afghanistan and, and Iraq, I used to remember that great poem by Rudyard Kipling, If, if you can keep your head when all around you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can doubt yourself, all that good stuff. I just wish some of my colleagues would remember that poem. Uh, how real poem. is this threat to Rishi Sunak? So I think a few weeks ago it might have seemed a bit ridiculous. 
and maybe it still is, but I think that the mood has really tangibly changed in the Conservative Party. It was really, really bad last week, maybe the worst week Rishi Sunak has had as Prime Minister. My colleagues reported on Thursday that members of the Cabinet were holding talks about replacing, whether it would be possible to replace Rishi Sunak with a caretaker leader. This is really the extension of that because Penny Mordaunt's name was one of the names mm. in contention. I think that these are real conversations, whether they, whether they amount to anything is different, but it's a real conversation, even if Bob wants to dismiss it. Inaya, in what do you think? I mean, the reason that Keir Starmer is likely going to be the next Prime Minister is not necessarily a raging endorsement of Keir Starmer. Sure. Um, it's because the Conservative Party have uh, bitterly disappointed their 2019 voters, and that's the reason why they're struggling in the polls, whether that's promising to reduce migration, but it reaching record levels. We talked about the fact that there's been little to no growth in the economy uh, for the best part of nearly 15 years. And the fact that NHS waiting times are, are, are soaring in terms of people's material lives and their experience of politics of the everyday, it has got worse. And I think that for those who want to uh, in, install Penny as leader, they have no actual analysis of why the Tory party is failing. And I think that that is part of the problem. Well, Bob, what do you say to those sort of, as you I say, the real substance of it? Actually, you know, that is a really substantive point and not just the sort of point scoring. You're absolutely right. When it comes to migration, after COVID, we've got that balance wrong. It went too high, some of it for very good reasons. Ukraine, Hong Kong. Can we be turning people away? No, but it massively impacted on our migration figures. Yeah, we, are going to be, we are going to be driving them down. Illegal immigration is down 30%, so the small boat crossings is down a third when they're going up in Europe. Is that enough? No, but we're voting on the Rwanda bill tonight, and I'll be making sure that I support it because we need to be using that deterrent effect. So I'm happy to go through it, all of these, and my answer to you, you're right, we were thrown off course by COVID by the cost of living. We're now back on course, and, and in the next six months, folks like you are going to have to make a decision. Do we actually want to stick with the government that's now going in the right direction or start again with a Labour government that doesn't share your values, doesn't share the values of the British people oh, and is likely to actually make a massive mess up because there is not, they don't have a plan and the few ideas they have are very unattractive. Well, right? let, Sarah, let, let Sarah respond. So it's chaos, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, who knows whether Rishi Sunak's going to be the Prime Minister going into an election. But would um, you like him to stay as opposed to Penny Morden? Because she think it polls make, well with Tories. I don't think it will make any difference to the public who have seen 14 years of absolute failure. The answer is an election, not a change of Tory leadership. But look, Rishi Sunak is not in charge any more. He is not in charge of his own party. He is not yes. in charge of what's happening. He can't even say something's racist until somebody forces oh, him we'll come on to, to that do in it. A he is weak um, and he is being challenged by his own side because the Tory government has failed and the economy is smaller now than when it was when Rishi Sunak came to power. And he you'd like an election. On every level. Well, and you'd of like course an election. We would like well, an election. Well, let's, let's explain this. this <coughs> well, let's explain these uh, tweets. First of all, from Stephen Swinford, uh, you can see at the bottom um, from the Times saying exclusive Rishi Sunak allies warn he will sooner call an election than be forced out of office by plotters. Uh, Simon Clark, former cabinet minister under Liz Truss, um, says this in response. The Lascelles principles suggest this would be a terrible idea. Alva, can you tell us what the Lascelles principles yeah. are? Yeah, good old Simon Clark <laughs> wheeling out these principles. So these principles are the sort of the three principles um, by which a monarch could refuse to grant an election if the prime minister asks because, for one. Yes, because the monarch um, has to agree to dissolve yes, parliament. Um, I think it's. I actually think the important thing with this is not really these principles or whether King Charles would be likely to deny Rishi Sunak an election. I think that's really unlikely. It's more just a statement of how annoyed Tory MPs are by this briefing from Number Ten. I don't think that they have taken very kindly to this briefing from a senior Rishi Sunak ally, ally that he would just call an election to, to thwart their their attempts. I don't think that they, they take it that seriously and it, it, I, I would say it's gone down badly. Are you annoyed, uh, Bob, by all of this? Um, yeah, because I want to focus on... Look, I'd love a May election because I, uh, I, I think it would expose the, the hollow heart of, the, of New Labour. They don't have a plan and what ideas they have are bad. Um, the, economy, the economy has turned a corner. Well, let's wages do are the going, economy. Well, let's do going, the economy. Wages are going up yeah. higher than inflation. We're going to have interest rates back down to about 2%. Uh, so uh, inflation back down to 2%, yeah. which means interest rates will fall, which means mortgage rates will fall. We have very low rates of, uh, of crime at the moment. We're going to get migration back on track. We, it, when Rishi says we're heading in the right direction, he's absolutely accurate. The question is, have we got enough time to do that? I would love a May election now, but if we have to go longer, then we'll have good news on the economy 
um, in the preceding uh, months. Well, is Bob right? With a bit more time, perhaps economic indicators could change some people's minds if we take inflation, if interest rates are cut, if people start to feel better because they've had those national insurance cuts despite the fact that overall tax burden is going up. Is that going to make any substantial difference? I, I, I think it's incredibly unlikely. Obviously, we, we, we cannot rule out the possibility that it will make a difference, but the time in the best possible scenario for a next election for the Tory party will be the end of the year. And the idea that people's uh, uh, pay packets and people's uh, sense of confidence in the future of the country is going to be radically transformed in order to close the gap that we're seeing, which some polls are demonstrating upwards of 15 per cent, just seems wishful thinking at best. Right. Could this change it for uh, the Conservatives or for the government. Um, the Times headline, Rwanda wants two-month pause after first migrant flight arrivals. That's because the bill could become law by Thursday, but Kigali wants to test the policy with a limited first wave of de deportations, which could start in May. Now, the bill could uh, get royal assent at the end of this week. You've just said you'll be uh, supporting so. it. There could be some amendments. Let's say flight does take off one because of this pause um, <coughs> from uh, Kigali. Um, if there is a flight taking off. Could that move the dial, uh, Bob? Look, I don't think any one thing is going to move the dial. I think we've had a really torrid time. Every single government, we've been dealing with huge global issues. Covid, as much as the Labour Party would like to pretend, was a global issue. Um, the Ukraine war and the economy and the, and the price shock was a massive European-wide issue. The grain, all these please let me finish a point. Grain, low, the grain war and the grain economy. and the grain spike. Uh, was a, a, um, a European-wide phenomenon. So we're dealing with lots of these sure. issues. So I don't think one thing's going fine. to get well, the back Well, that's fine. If you don't think one thing... Well, and by the way, the Home Office doesn't think... recognise that, that particular okay. headline about the pause. But anyway, if it becomes yeah. law, flights start to take off, your position is still you'll oppose it. You, you will not carry on uh, with the Rwanda policy. Yes, the Conservatives have lost control of our borders. We've seen huge increases um, of people coming across on small boats and now uh, we have a plan that's already cost us half a billion pounds and that will only, by the Home Office's own admission in the papers today, we'll see about 150 people take off if it's successful. That's what the Home Are Office is Are you aiming to stop the boats, by the way? That was the, that was Rishi Sunak's pledge. Are you, is that going to be your promise as well, to we stop the boats? a proper plan to have a proper, fair we asylum proper system. Plan. Now, the first thing to do is to tackle the smugglers who are making all the money from taking taking people across how, the channel. How do you tackle the, the second, Because we'd have enough police force oh, across... Please. You haven't got a plan. Come on. You don't have a plan. Your plan is to do what we well, were doing three years ago. Your plan is 14 years of failure, so let me explain our plan. Our plan is, firstly, you need to have police forces, not just in France, but across Europe, to make sure we are uh, tackling the uh, smuggling gangs who, who um, are working across borders. Secondly, we need to bring down those... Um, huge uh, lists of people who are waiting for decisions, which is why we said we would put money into that. We also have said today a thousand strong force to return people. The number of returns mm, has halved that's under this story. government. Yeah. We're not even returning what, criminals what anymore. What do you do if countries we're, we're say they don't want their citizens back? Seekers. We, well, you also have to have uh, returns agreements with other countries, and that's what we have to negotiate in a them. way that we had doing before. It. You're doing it with a country that's cost you half a billion pounds, that's halfway Albania, around the world. We're doing it with Turkey, we're doing Albania, it with I agree. I agree. We're doing, I we're agree. doing all this stuff. But you're not we're doing, doing all this stuff. stuff. And actually, Bob, under you, you can say you're doing all this you, stuff, but got, returns you, you, have you halved. Said, you said you want returns. Returns have halved. No, well, 90% of Albanians now are going back. Returns have halved, though. Do you say that stat isn't true? We are being overwhelmed by a global crisis. The, the simple answer is You're, illegal migration down. Illegal borders, migration is down a third a when, it is, when it is growing elsewhere in the European Union. All right. Well, let me uh, well, let me ask Anaya, since you um, sort of interjected on Labour's policy, do either of these plans have a chance of working, and does it matter? Well, I think when it comes to the Rwanda plan, it is at least in principle meant to be a deterrent. The reality is is that you cannot return people back to France because they're not going to take them. Um, many of the countries that are, are their country of origin will not uh, take them either. And then oftentimes um, a lot of the people have claims that are essentially unfalsifiable. You know, they say that they might be persecuted. If somebody says that and there's very little evidence and oftentimes you just have to accept their claims. The reality is is that you cannot just tackle the people smugglers. That is just an abstract notion. If, if it was as, as easy as that, then I think it would have been done already. The idea of Rwanda is to be a deterrent. And I think that it, we are not the only country doing it. Denmark is also doing it. Another kind of 
bastion of liberal democracy. I think it is a policy that we need to at least Labour follow Party through to the end. Back in Sarah, let's, uh, let's Sarah answer. come back on the deterrent point, because you're absolutely right. Of course, we need deterrence. And uh, people smugglers tell people uh, lots of stories and, and persuade people to spend lots of money. The fact is, if you come here now on a small boat, you will be here for years. So the people smugglers say, You'll be here for years. People if burn we their passports actually and their documents. shorten that time so that if people were not entitled to asylum, as um, you know, they many are not, they were returned. That would get rid of that actual real deterrent. It would, it would, it would really um, have an impact. Whereas the Rwanda scheme hasn't even happened. We've been talking about it for years. This is the third piece of legislation. I lose count. The other two. What happened to those yes, big? Bills? All right. Well, hang on. With the answer to I'm going, to, I'm going to leave it there no, because you passed the bill. That's because we're you passed, by lefty lawyers. You passed so the bills. The you passed the bills. Literally nothing. Lefty Let's lawyers. see if it becomes law by the end of the week. You mentioned uh, the Conservative uh, donor obliquely, Frank Hester, uh, because that story obviously dominated uh, last week. His alleged uh, comments about Diane Abbott were first reported in The Guardian. Uh, this was a tweet uh, by Kemi Badenoch, the Business and Trade Secretary, uh, in response to those remarks. Um, she said, Hester's 2019 comments, as reported, were racist. I welcome his apology. Abbott, because the comments were about uh, Diane Abbott, and I disagree on a lot, but the idea of linking criticism of her to being a black woman is appalling. It's never acceptable to conflate someone's views with the colour of their skin. But she was asked about the situation uh, with Frank Hester this morning on BBC Breakfast by John Kay, and this is how she responded. I just wonder, how did it make you feel when, when you read those alleged comments for the first time? Uh, it didn't make me feel anything in particular. I just read them and I thought that uh, these comments were, were inappropriate. I hadn't actually realised the news for a while, but it seemed to be something that was dominating uh, the headlines. In fact, I'm still amazed that over a week later I'm, still, I'm being asked about it. Well, you, you felt strongly enough about it to, to come out on social media and, and say that they were racist, even though at the time the Prime Minister hadn't yes, done so. Yes, that, that was a week ago. Yes, that was a week ago. That was but, a week ago. But, I'm surprised I'm still talking about it. Are you surprised? Because this is a man who is the Conservative Party's biggest donor. We know that he's given £10 million uh, to your party. Um, mm. Are you comfortable with the fact that uh, that money is, is not being given back? Yes, uh, and as I said uh, earlier this morning, and also, as I said last week uh, on Tuesday when I explained my views, um, I thought that the comments were racist, but he had apologised. I think when people apologise, we need to accept that and move on. What did you make of that exchange following on from her being the first minister to call out those comments as reported as racist? I think sometimes Kemi Badenoch, like some other politicians, can just become a bit tetchy in interviews. And isn't, isn't that what we just saw there, that she was finding those comments annoying, she wanted to be talking about other things, and, 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 and we just sort of caught her essentially in a bit of a bad mood? Um, I, I mean, she did force Starling Street to change the line on this in a way that did undermine Rishi Sunak. It was quite a big intervention. So I, I think that I think I mean even just for the, exp the expressions on the panel there we all find it, it, it a bit baffling. I'm not really sure. I think there's a lack of consistency maybe in her positioning. Because she it. seemed unmoved suddenly about those those comments when her tweet seemed to indicate something different. I think two things could be true at once. I think that the comments were undoubtedly racist and I think it's quite disappointing how um, the Conservative Party did handle it. So, for example, um, when I think Keir Starmer in PMQs once said that Rishi Sunak was un-British, there was lots of... Um, not un-British, doesn't understand Britain. There was lots of uh, Tories saying how racist that was, which mm. it, it wasn't a racist comment. But something that was clearly uh, a racist comment, we were being told it was rude. And I think that this really does sow distrust within ethnic minority communities, many of which I think are now natural Conservative voters. You know, they believe in hard work, family, yeah. personal responsibility yeah. and many traditional values. And being uh, equivocal in calling out racism, I think, is really harmful. At the same time, these were reported comments 
that were made in a private chat five years ago. And I can understand why she might think, OK, maybe it's time we do move on. I also think that the money is a really crucial context here because you mentioned the £10 million pounds that the Conservatives have already accepted from Frank mm, Hester. Mm. Kat Nealon at Tortoise reported last mm, week that, that he, has, he has made another £5 million pound donation which hasn't needed to be declared yet. I think there's been some confusion on this over the weekend. It looks as though that donation has been made but the Conservatives don't need to declare it until June because of the way the timings work on these things. So they have until, until June to decide whether they can they can accept this publicly or not. But they are, are clearly worried about distancing themselves further from him when they feel like they need that money. To put that money into context, the, the single biggest donation to the Conservatives last year was £10 million from Lord Sainsbury. Frank Hester matched that. They have raised the limit on, on donations to political parties in elections and they're hitting right up against it losing this money from Frank Hester would have a tangible impact well, on the election campaign. Sh well, so sh should that money go back, Bob? He's apologised. Um, they were really he's apologised for being rude and he's apologised for any hurt, I think, broadly. Hasn't apologised for being racist or making racist remarks. OK, um, whether there was some issue about him denying what he said or saying that what he did was slightly different. Look, I have to say I take Penny's line on this. Um, oh. uh, sorry, um, uh, Kemi's line on this. Right, I was going to say. Um, uh, well, I'm actually going to quote Penny as well, but I, I, I think, listen, I, I, I agree with Penny, uh, Kemi said. I also find I totally understand her frustration with it because at a time when we want to get on with other things, we're still talking about this. And actually, sorry, this is pure cynicism from the Labour Party as Penny... Oh. Penny exposed in the House of Commons last week when she listed all Labour's ethically questionable uh, donations or donations which uh, raised a massive question mark. So, but, but, yeah, um, but should, should, should the Conservative so, Party take another five million? Sorry. Look, the guy's apologised and actually, look, he's a successful businessman, paid lots in tax, yeah. contributed. Uh, if the guy said, I'm not apologising, fine. But actually, he's apologised and said it was a but stupid thing you, to say. End of. But will you honestly be comfortable with a Conservative election campaign bankrolled <coughs> by the man behind these views? When you say man behind these views, it was one-off He, one he, called, he called for a Member of Parliament one to off, be shot. One-off colour remark. What do you mean, like some of the Labour front bench have done recently? Well, I think if you... Uh, sorry, well, if sorry you hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's, bench, let's talk about hate-filled language. Too. Let's talk about hate-filled language. The leader of the Labour Party... Deputy talking? leader of the Labour Party... Please let me make the point. The deputy leader of the Labour Party referred to her political opponents as scum. She's yeah. still in her job. Right. But, but, but if you would do like not give Labour, me the Labour Party, as a Tory MP, if you would like I Labour know to return that money. I see, I see Labour's hate-filled language all the time, be it its activists or its politicians. But if you have a problem Please with hate-filled language, don't talk to me about hate-filled language. Should you language. not return that money? He's apologised. I'm not judging somebody I think on Andrew one offensive remark. Apologised too, though. It took her a month. In our, is that is that good enough? He's um, apologised for being rude. Is that enough to say? Well, yeah, we'll keep taking money. Well, I, I think. To, in my honest opinion, I do actually think it is. I do think that um, we do live in a culture where someone may say comments that some people find offensive and then that is unbelievably unforgivable for the rest of their career. And I think that there is a danger in blowing this out of um, huge proportion. The comments were racist. I think the Tories should have called it out as racism Hamas clearly. Remarks? And he should, have been, he should have apologised for racist remarks. Yeah. But I think and taken them back. Yeah, well, the is there a danger, is there a, hang on, hang on. Is there is a danger is that? Sarah, that the Labour Party could find itself in a similar situation... It Already with is. Don't, with or, it already, already is. is, according uh, to Bob, because of comments that have been made uh, previously uh, by members. Now, is it a competition about who makes the most hate filled, who well, makes the most helpful? But if you are going to take a, if you're going to make a stand, um, you could find yourself in a similar position with donors. So the reason we're still talking about this is because of the really awful way in which it's been handled by the Conservative Party. Frank Hester hasn't apologised for being racist. It's a half apology. We are not talking about ruining his career. He is free to do whatever he wants to do. The question well, is, that he shouldn't have any should role the in Conservative life. Party be comfortable with taking this additional well, £5 million, which is in process now, as we understand it, or not? And why was Rishi Sunak so weak that he doesn't know the difference between right and wrong and it has to be Kemi who calls him out and then he says something's racist? All right. He well, said... Let Frank Hester said Diane Abbott should be shot. I feel awful re repeating this because I know it's very hurtful mm. for her. And she has had such a And your former abuse. shadow chancellor and said that uh, Esther McVeigh should be lynched. Get real. Get real. You are a bunch all right, of Bob. left all right, all right. hypocrites. Keep the, keep the temper down. This is down. not about Hamas. This is Two nonsense. days after, 1,200 people were slaughtered by Hamas 
One of Labour's donors said, one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. All right, well, then let and, me put the question. The, I, deputy, yeah. the, the would-be deputy prime minister was appalled by those remarks. You're keeping that money. You give that money back. You have a leg to stand on. Otherwise, all right, well, let's Sarah, let Sarah justify it. All about all right, Bob, let, Sarah, money. let Sarah answer it. But, Sarah, those were comments that were derided by many uh, people, including those within your own party. What do you say about standards? Would you hand the money back if someone said something similar? Bob thinks that has been said by a Labour uh, donor when it comes to Hamas. Um, would you hand the money back? Well, forgive me, I, I don't actually know about that case, and I yes, genuinely... You do. Oh, come on, I, Sarah. I Sarah, yes, Sarah, Sarah, you do. You do. I genuinely... Don't. All right, hang on, hang on, Bob. I'm doing this, Bob, don't. not you. I um, genuinely don't. Let me, let me say... We need to be really careful about donations. The Labour Party is very proud that we have so many businesses now don't funding us, and we are. And very would you hand the money back if one of your high do fund donors there said to be some changes to some of the rules about foreign donors, about shell, do shell right. company donations? We do Let need to make sure the public can trust uh, what we're doing and where the money's coming from. But I'll be clear: donors are giving money to Labour because we have a plan to change the country, and the Tories have. All right. Well, let's let's talk about um, Diane Abbott because she has been the target uh, of these remarks and there were scenes which we can show you from Friday evening of a demonstration in her constituency in support of her where the crowd is singing we are with Diane she no longer sits as a Labour MP having had the whip removed 11 months ago for saying Irish Jewish and traveller people do not face racism all their lives but that investigation has gone on for about 11 months for four sentences that she said uh, a year ago. Sarah, should she be readmitted to the Labour Party? Well, you know, you're not going to like my answer. There is a process that well, I know nothing about. But it hasn't stopped Angela Rayner and Harriet Harman I, saying I, it. Uh, well, and I was... Um, on Westminster Hour last night and I was talking about how a couple of years ago I went to the Notting Hill Carnival with, with Diane Abbott and it was extraordinary the number of people who came up to us as we walked through the streets saying, you are, you know, But why can an Angela Rayner so say people. she should be allowed back in? I mean, you may not think she should either way, but why can't you answer the question? I, the I know that Diane Abbott has been an inspiration to many, many, many people, including myself. I have worked with her on knife crime. She has been quite extraordinary in many ways. There is a process going on that I do not know uh, uh, where has it has it taken to too long? And what, has it um, taken too long? It, it, it has taken the time that it needs to take. I don't know uh, what is going on within that investigation. We have to allow that to run its course. Has it taken too long and should she be readmitted to the party? Um, well, well, I don't think that it's necessarily because of the events um, with Frank Hester that that's the reason that she should be admitted. But I do think that, yeah. you know, it, she should be admitted. As far as I'm aware, Naz Shah uh, was readmitted when she was suspended for saying, you know, the Jews are rallying in, in relation to um, uh, her election. So I do think that there is form in the Labour Party. If people have demonstrated that they apologise, they take back those comments, they didn't mean them, then they can actually be readmitted. Re and I think that would be a good thing. Let's talk about something completely different. This headline in the Daily Telegraph. Labour's private school tax raid could cost taxpayer £1.6 billion a year. This is reporting that Labour's policy of charging VAT on private school fees could actually cost, rather than raise, money for the Treasury. It's based on research from the free market think tank, the Adam Smith Institute. Well, let's talk to James Price, who's from uh, the Institute. Welcome to you, James. Why would this idea from Labour cost rather than raise money? Hi there, thanks so much for having me on. I think that we have a big problem where we try and put forward all these ideas of how much something will cost and how much something will raise. And we only ever look, in, this is in government or anything else, in terms of the static cost that it will do. We never go and look at the second order or third order consequences of doing this. You know, something like the Office for Budget Responsibility, it makes these great projections, it always has to revise them. So this idea from Labour that it would raise this, this money by adding this VAT onto these, uh, these private school fees will raise money, yes, in the first instance, but then you don't ah. see what will happen afterwards. You don't see what the number of people who will then not be able to afford those fees. You don't see the people that will then stop working if they can't afford those fees because they're only, frankly, doing a job so they can put their children through a second school. And the Exchequer then misses out on the huge amount of money that it's actually generated from those people doing that. You don't see what happens then to the children who have to move into the state sector and the cost that that will have. And there are just all these other knock-on impacts that, that haven't been looked at. And so if you then look at how many children would actually migrate from the private uh, sector into the public sector, I think that the, this one Labour idea is they assume something like 3 to 7% of people. If you assume that 10 to 15%, then it makes no money at all. And you assume higher, then it starts to cost the Exchequer money as well. All right. Sarah, what do you say in response? Uh, I think the 
Adam Smith Institute um, have done some good work in the past, but they've really let themselves down with this report. Uh, if you don't take my word for it, look at Sam Friedman, former advisor to Michael Gove, who said this morning that the figures don't make the remotest sense. Which Dan figures? Needle, uh, Which figures? The figures um, in terms of um, 25 uh, the assumptions of... about the number of uh, people that would that will transition. But how do you it, know? It, the Independent uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies, which mm. is independent, mm. unlike the Adam Smith Institute, shows that uh, removing tax exemptions from private schools will have little effect on the number of pupils attending private schools. Now, also, it is the case that private schools have been putting up their fees over and above inflation for many years, and that hasn't had an impact on numbers. It is also the case that this this uh, policy is overwhelmingly popular with the public and it is also the case that this funding will see new teachers, new resources in our state schools, more mental health support, right. and more speech and language early intervention. Now I understand where people are coming from. I have a, a mother who sent me to private school and used her money to do that. Mm. I have three children in the state school. I do not care any less for my children than my mother cares well, for let me. me get James... I am just as aspirational and I, I want us to get to a place where people say our state schools are the best in the world for our kids. We don't, we don't necessarily need private schools. James? Yeah, well, despite the, the silly pocket square they're wearing, I wasn't uh, lucky enough to go to any of these sort of fancy private schools. And I know that people, when you say private school, independent school, whatever, they'll think about the Eatons and the Harrows, these places with lots and lots of money that can definitely absorb these costs. But most independent schools just aren't like that. I think there's actually the independent school that, that Sarah went to in Croydon that's having to shut down in the next uh, year or two because of financial difficulties already. What happens when these extra costs come on? They get passed on to parents. If they don't, they're going to come out of wage bills and all these other problems as well. There's no actually, we've seen this. We've this happen there in Greece. There is no evidence. In, the in IFS Greece, have in, said no, 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 really well, clearly the, there the is IFS no evidence. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that viewers want us to, to argue back and forth on the different papers, but that, oh, that IFS know. report uh, is actually based on a, a 2002 study from America with not a lot of evidence, and there's data in there as well from the 1990s. I think the Economist described it as a bit of a guess. Um, we, we do actually have an example of where this has been tried. So in Greece, in I think 2015, they applied a 23% VAT on private schools, and again, the Economist described it as absolute mayhem. It went terribly badly. It's not about who cares for children or who doesn't care. Actually, I think schools have done really, really well since 2010. It used to be that only two-thirds right. were good or outstanding. Now it's over 90%. So state oh, schools are getting on. better already. The gap and they're actually going to get hit worse if this and policy high attainment is Well, let Sarah, let Sarah respond. What well, that, the gap between low and high attainment is growing at pace. We don't have the kind of uh, music and the cultural side in our schools anymore. We're not good at maths. There are all kinds of problems with teacher recruitment uh, and schools that are literally um, falling apart. Um, we need to invest in our schools and we need to make choices. And the reality is that private schools school fees have been going up well over and above inflation for years and we haven't seen the results, we haven't seen a response and the IFS are clear that there, there will be little movement. Well, James, who's funded uh, your research, by the way? Was it private uh, schools? Uh, no, absolutely not, no. I'm actually not in the, the fundraising side of any of these things. The, the ASI gets lots of small donations from people who care about our work. I mean, Adam Smith uh, would have turned 300 last year, the father of modern economics. We're a research charity. We actually go into lots of schools and do lots of talks in these places. Um, and, you know, we, so we, I see at the coalface how good schools can and can't look. I All used right. to be an advisor in the Department for Education as well. And okay. this policy isn't going to raise the money that, that some of these people say that it will. It just won't. Our education and our schools have been really high on the international league tables of late. Very and actually, um, the reforms introduced, as I think was alluded to under Michael Gove, has actually made a really substantial difference Massively. in education. But do you agree it would be popular? But at the same time, when it comes to this private school policy, I think it is uh, penalising parents who, let's remember, already pay for education through their through their taxes. Yeah. But he was totally right to say that the image of private schools is this kind of eaten. But the overwhelming majority of private schools aren't like that. I mean, my mother worked three jobs to send my sister and I to feed paying schools, not because she was this super rich woman that wanted to harm working class kids is because that's exactly. her way of um, uh, supporting aspiration. I, I think it is demonising a huge section of the public that are doing that. You've only got about I, 20 seconds, but it, I, it is popular, it does poll well, it, but will it raise enough, any money? It, I mean, the IFS, the only independent body looking at this, does think that it will raise over a, a billion, billion pounds. Mm. Um, 
even if it, over a billion and a half, I think it is <coughs> worth emphasising that no disrespect to the ASI in other ways, this this report looks quite shaky based on like some wild assumptions that have been quite discredited this morning from people right. across the political spectrum. It's all we have time for, but thank you to all of my guests, and I will be back tomorrow at 12:15 with more Politics Live. So please join me then. Bye bye.